Thank you. Um, I'll be presenting some joint work with my PhD supervisor at the time um, that we both did at Oxford. And um, we worked on the problem of like verification. Um, and we're thinking about like, how can we improve existing verification algorithms? Um, normally, why? Okay. Um, normally I start like with a bit of like an introduction, which I don't think is necessary really after like our good, um, our like great talk this morning. Um, because I feel like we're getting, we're seeing the same images um, over and over again today. Um, but just a quick reminder in terms of like the maths, like what is kind of our like actual formulation of our problem. We've got given a neural network F, a train network, um, our tree image, um, uh, the correct class. And then the question is, is there a different image, um, X dash, and a different class um, such that the neural network assigns like a higher score to the incorrect class than it does to the true class. Um, and as we already like discussed today quite a lot, um, these adversarial examples, so the images on the right exist um, for basically whatever architecture we're using, um, which obviously not ideal. Um, I don't think it's um, realistic that we can get rid of all of them, but I think it might still be interesting to see, just to like evaluate how robust are they. We're never gonna get the perfect M model, but we might be able to get a slightly more robust model. Um, so how have we done that in the past? I think a very common way of doing it is once we've got our training neural network, um, we have a normal test set, a clean test set, um, evaluate on that, and then we get a clean accuracy. And then also we use adversarial attacks to um, uh, base in the same way as we term test the clean accuracy um, to run on like a certain number of test images. And then if the attack is successful for like 20% of all images, for example, we say that the neural network is 80% robust. Um, that's been done quite a few times over the last few years. And like, basically there has been like great new papers with new like adversarial training uh, methods um, that claimed that it was, it was a big improvement over like previous methods and they are like X percentage robust only for like a year later for there to be a better adversarial attack and suddenly realize actually the number that was reported isn't really true. It was just that the adversarial attack wasn't very good. So it didn't really find any of the adversarial examples. Um, so that's kind of why we need verification a bit, because with verification, um, if our like um, method says that an, a neural network is robust for a certain image, then we can trust that. And sure, there might be better like methods later on um, down the line, but um, we know that any verification method is kind of comp uh, is like sound in that sense. Um, so that kind of sounds great. Um, and the next step is kind of like how, uh, how can we actually like formulate it? And the easiest way is just we can basically formulate it as a simple um, question of is the output of, of our function, which is essentially just a neural network slightly modified with the last layer, is it positive or negative? Now, if it's positive, then we know for certain that the neural network is robust for that image. If it's negative, then um, there is at least one adversarial example. For example, the one like the image that contains is um, basically the minimum there might be multiple or, um, or like many like different adversary examples. Um, now the problem is this is quite like a difficult problem to solve because it's like really, really non-convex. So one of the things we do is we relax the uh, ready activations. Um, the same is true for different activations um, because they're basically the reason why the problem is so difficult. If it were only a linear problem, it'd be very easy to solve. So what um, we've got here is we've got like a normal ready and the x-axis is kind of like the input to the rally and the y-axis is the output. Um, and because the normal rally is very much non-convex, we've relaxed it in this particular way, which is called like the planet relaxation. Um, and in order to do that, we need two things. We need the lower bound and the upper bound. And these are bounds kind of for the input of the rally. So like the, um, if the lower bound is minus 20, then we know that there can't be an input to the rally that's minus 30. Now there's like three different cases here, basically. The first one is that the lower bound and the upper bound are both negative. That, that case is kind of easy because then we know the output of the value is just zero, kind of easy problem to solve. And um, likewise, if both the lower bound and the upper bound are positive, we know it's basically just like the identity function. Again, very easy problem to solve. And um, the difficulty is if the lower bound is negative and the upper bound is positive, like I've shown here, because then we got this relaxation, which kind of makes it easier, but it's also because it's, um, a relaxation kind of changes the whole problem. And the um, uh, kind of the output that we might get is might actually be more negative than the actual minimum. Um, so the question is then like kind of how do we like solve this? And like a very um, common thing is branch and bound. And while we're kind of branching over, we're branching over the possibilities of the value. 
So we picked like an uh, ambiguous rally um, and say, look, there's two cases here, basically. Either the rally is negative or it's positive. So like, let's just branch here. And like the first um, sub problem is just let's just assume it's negative. And the other one is let's just assume it's positive. And we can carry on doing that. And in theory, do that for every single rally. In practice, that's obviously not really possible given the size of new networks. But then even once we've like um, branched on a certain rally, we still need to like fix and uh, kind of solve the problem. Um, and the best way to do that, or at least one way of doing that, is um, to use duality. Why is duality useful? Um, it is because any value that we get for the dual is a lower bound for any possible primal output. So whatever dual um, um, var um, variables we use, we've got a lower bound. Um, this is obviously quite useful because we are trying to find the minimum of our function. Now, if we find a single like set of dual variables, which um, get us like a positive dual value, that means um, we might not know exactly the minimum of the primal, but we know it's greater than zero, and that's all we care about. We, don't, we only care about whether it's robust or not, not really how robust, if that even makes sense. Um, now, even though like uh, we can use any set of like dual variables to get a valid lower bound, and in order to like, actually get like a useful one, we need to like um, find very good dual um, variables. So we need to basically maximize this function. And there's many different ways of doing this. Um, and the initial one was using Garobi, which well, works very well in that like it um, outputs good answers, but basically just takes forever. And that's why like a few years ago, um, it's been suggested to use like um, gradient ascent, which is basically the same as like um, subgradient descent. Um, uh, together with Adam. Um, now, what we thought is basically when we do this branch and bound, we do the same thing over and over again. We have this massive branch and bound, um, branch and bound tree, and for every single subproblem, we essentially do the same thing. And then we might do the same thing not only for one image, but for many images, or not even for just many images on one network, but even on like loads of different networks. So we thought if we're doing this so many times, maybe there's some kind of underlying structure here that we can learn. And maybe that we can we can use that to essentially speed up the whole optimization procedure. Um, so our um, idea was let's use a graph neural network. So the structure of the graph neural network is kind of uh, based on the neural network that we are trying to verify. And um, to input nodes, hidden nodes, and output nodes. Now the first thing we do is we create feature vectors. Um, what is a feature vector? It's basically just like a multi-dimensional vector with um, items that we essentially just compute ourselves and pass it to the graph neural network. So as an example for the input node, we might just um, have the lower and upper bounds of each input node, and that could be our feature vector, or we can add like more interesting information. And now on top of that, we also have embedding vectors. These are also multidimensional um, vectors, but the um, big difference is that these are kind of learned. So they're trying to learn basically some kind of information about the node itself, maybe the state of the whole optimization, algorithm, um, just something kind of useful. Um, and how do we do that? We first um, thought about, OK, let's have a look at existing algorithms. So for example, uh, super gradient ascent. And what does that does it really do? There's like a forward step and then a backward step to um, in order to compute some gradients. So we thought, OK, maybe we can kind of um, do a similar thing here and update our embedding vectors in this kind of forward, backward um, way. So the first thing we do is we um, compute some embedding vectors for the first layer um, using the kind of feature of, um, vectors that we've already, um, already kind of given the graph neural network and using a learn function. And then we pass this information um, down the graph neural network all the way to the output layer. Um, and we do that with kind of a learn function. And once we've done that, um, every embedding vector is kind of influenced by embe um, embedding vectors from previous layers. Um, but obviously we want every embedding vector to be kind of influenced by every other one. So now we do like the backward step and go back with through the graph neural network. And once you've done that once, um, just like a single forward and backwards um, step, every embedding vector is influenced by all the other ones. Um, at least all the ones that it's kind of connected to, assuming we're a fully connected layer, a uh, fully connected neural network. And um, we could do several rounds of that, but um, at least for like, our work, we actually realized only one round is enough. So at this point, we've got all these multidimensional embedding vectors. So obviously, we need kind of need to do, uh, turn them back into uh, geo variables. So all we do is we've got some kind of score function, which is like a learned function again. 
and it just takes every single embedding vector um, one after the other and like uh, turns them back into like a dual variable or really like to be kind of be more precise we um because it's like an iterative approach it's kind of the movement and um, like the dual movement so we've already got some dual variables and the same way as normally we take the gradient to update where we are instead of using the gradient we now use the output of the gnn and and just like uh before we we're using a, a gradient ascent we took several steps of this um and to uh, compute the gradient took one single step then like um if we're still haven't reached the optimal value, we take another step and so on. We do the same in our case. So we like repeatedly call the GNN to get different directions of movement and hopefully reach kind of the desired value more quickly than if you just used the gradient. Um, now, I think um, might be running out of time a little bit. So I might um, skip this and uh, either talk about any questions or in the post session. Um, but like just briefly talking about some of the results, we compared it against um, three different baselines. Um, the first two are both kind of Groby based um, baselines, and the last one is super gradient ascent, which I already mentioned um, earlier. Um, and here we just like plotting how many properties we're able to like verify at any given time compared to the different baselines. And in this case, we trained our GNN on the um, on a specific neural network that we call the base model, and tested on the same one. Um, There's just like a different plot where we just compared. Okay, for each individual image. For like property um, and for how many of them was the GNN the fastest one and um, for how many um, the Groby um, branch and bound based one and so on and um, so in this case like 78 percent of all images the GNN was the fastest um, to verify it successfully now um, what we also tried is like what happens if we train the G um, GNN on a base model so um, just one neural network and then like test it on a completely different one so this is a neural network that has a different architecture Basically, like wider, it has the same number of layers, but each layer is um, uh, is basically bigger, um, and it generalizes um, well enough so that it still outperforms the baselines. And the same is true if we um, train it on the um, same network and test it on a new network that's essentially deeper. So yeah, it has the same width, but just quite a few more layers, and obviously also different weights. So um, just to summarize. We introduced a kind of like new RMG and an architecture, um, specifically for verification. Um, and uh, our like method outperforms existing verification methods um, in terms of uh, achieving or like computing better bounds more quickly. And it generalizes to unseen methods as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.